Pro Group Management. Workers' comp that works for you. Welcome to Nevada Newsmakers on the broadcast today. Darian Pollard is here. She's the president of Nevada State College. Here for the whole show on an all-new Nevada Newsmakers. It's the $250,000 Progressive Windfall of Cash at Carson Valley Inn. Weekly Progressives could accumulate up to $35,000 in cash and $20,000 in guaranteed grand prize giveaways. It's the $250,000 Progressive Windfall of Cash at the Carson Valley Inn. Modern Boutique Ahern Hotel and Events Center in Las Vegas. Host meetings and events on two floors. Stay in luxurious rooms and suites. Unlimited branding opportunities. Regional Italian cuisine by Chef Mark Segrisi. Flexible event spaces. Full buyout options. Visit ahernhotel.com today. Pro Group Management offers workers' comp services to a growing number of industries. As businesses grow and change with the times, the need for a solid workers' comp program must be flexible and up-to-date. The evolving nature of regulations can make staying ahead of complex tasks challenging. But Pro Group Management simplifies the work so your industry can move forward and succeed. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. Reckless government spending on frivolous projects is bad enough. Even worse, spending to send COVID relief checks to criminals in prison. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto voted to allow COVID relief checks to go to the likes of the Boston Marathon bomber and hundreds of thousands of other convicted murderers and criminals, allowing almost a billion dollars in COVID relief checks to go to hardened criminals in prison. Tell Senator Cortez Masto to start voting against reckless, wasteful spending to stop inflation. It's the $150,000 Island Time giveaways going on now at Tamarack Casino. Win up to $10,000 in weekly cash and free play giveaways. And over $50,000 in grand prize giveaways, including Hawaiian vacations. It's the $150,000 Island Time giveaways at Tamarack Casino. This is Nevada Newsmakers with host Sam Shad, a no-holds-barred political forum. Now, from the Nevada Newsmakers Broadcast Headquarters, here is Sam Shad. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we're delighted to welcome to the program for the first time, Darian Pollard. She is the president of Nevada State College. Pleasure to have you on the program. Delighted to be here. Thank you. And so this is pretty much uh, your one-year anniversary, correct? Can you believe that? A year has gone so fast. So let's start out with the basics, mm. because a lot of people don't understand what Nevada State College is. Um, it's not a community college, it's not UNLV. Where does it fit in the system? Sure, so if you know the system of higher education, this is what we consider a mid-tier teaching institution. So I love that descriptor. We, s we reside right in the middle of those spaces where you have your UNLV, UNR, which is, and DRI, which is committed to scholarly pursuit of research, the production of new ideas. Uh, you have the community colleges, which are really the main access point, really entry into work that is entry-level work. But where my institution sits, Nevada State College, it sits right in the middle. So teaching what they would call second tier in the Carnegie classification. And it is really about building economic mobility, but we are what we often call stewards of place. Uh, we're very much committed to the local environments in which we situate ourselves, and we're very much committed around workforce and economic development that drives community development. So Nevada State College joins the ranks of uh, wonderful state college universities across the country. In fact, uh, you saw state college universities come about with what we actually call normal schools, uh, the creation of teaching institutions that produce the next generation of teachers. So Nevada State, not unlike many of those institutions, is known most for its work around production of nurses. We're actually the number one producer of baccalaureate prepared nurses in the state. And then you add teachers to that. But if you think about a growing economy, it's one that has to have more than just teachers and nurses. So we have a robust criminal justice program, psychology. Uh, we have multiple education tracks that you have. And we also have a graduate program in speech language pathology because that was a need of the region. And it's a four-year college. It is a four-year institution. A no, it's not a two-year. It's a four-year institution. We actually also offer one graduate degree, uh, a master's degree, and then we'll also be adding what we call an educational specialist degree, uh, which is someone who is uh, earning more than a master's but less than a doctorate. And in the future, we may actually offer doctorates, uh, but again, practically based. 
these ideas that people are going directly into the communities that we serve and working to build that community up. So your campus is huge. It sits on 509 acres, yes. of which you're using not that much at no, this point no, in time. No. Um, what are your plans for the future? I mean, you've got a new building that's already opened. Yeah, so we have, a, a, we are a five, cam we have five buildings on this campus, and it's kind of rem remarkable to me that you look at uh, the vista of the campus. This was an investment that's happened a significant area, but we're growing so fast. Uh, we have over 7,000 students that we're serving right now. And what's amazing to me is that we have one of the largest space deficits in the state as it relates to the NCHI institutions. So I think going to your point, one of the things we have to do is that we want to grow responsibly. We want to be able to drive both economic development and workforce development and build out a campus. So I think one of the things I was brought here for is I've had a little bit of experience in that. Uh, having done so at my previous institution, we were able to bring a hospital to the campus and really build out out uh, one of the campuses in a way to really be this driver uh, for the community. I'd like to think that we're going to be doing that right now. We're putting in a structure in place where we can look at uh, how to bring in businesses through partnerships with us, but also we're in the midst of master planning and building out the rest of our campus. So right now we have residence halls, we have uh, multiple campuses, but we are, excuse me, multiple buildings, but we're also in the midst of really planning out some profound needs that we have at oh, Nevada State. Okay, so as you've been doing your investigating yeah. uh, for what's gonna come at the next legislative session, what are your hopes and dreams there? Well, I think if we went in two spaces, one there's operational and there's one is capital. And I'll start with the latter first. I think capital, one of the things we recognize because we are growing as rapidly as we are, uh, there's a need for additional spaces, in particular for us around student support areas. So fortunately for us, after going through the entry ranking process this year, uh, Nevada State is very high. We're the second uh, building that is being requested from the legislature this year, which is gonna be an academic village. It allows us to bring and house all of these these robust support services that are necessary uh, to the new majority that we serve within higher education. And what's very important about that is that these students need a space, space where they can study, they can get support services, but also where they can experience college robustly. So that's one thing we're very high about. We support uh, this very thoughtful, deliberate process that NCHI went through this year in order to prepare for the legislative cycle. But we're also hoping to see some level of investment or reinvestment in our operating dollars. As you know better than anybody, we lost a significant amount of money right. prior to my arrival here. So we're hoping to see some of that reinvestment. Uh, the thing that's important to me, and, and I'm a living witness of this, higher education is the only thing I know that can help someone pull a family from poverty into middle class and beyond. So investments in education are rarely uh, not something that benefits the entire community. And that's your story? That is my story, 100%. Okay, but I mean, that's your personal story. That's it. So you wanna talk about that? I'm happy to. Uh, I'm a little brown girl from the south side of Chicago. Uh, my life is bigger than anything I ever imagined. I grew up in poverty, uh, but I had a family that believed in education. Uh, my mother died when I was very young, so I was primarily raised by my father, and he was very deliberate in this idea that you're gonna be a survivor, you're gonna figure out how to survive and navigate an environment that may not have been uh, the ideal, but it was a community. And this is the thing I always, I bristle so much when I watch the portrayals or listen to the portrayals of Chicago, uh, because where I grew up, yeah, there were some rough parts, but there's some rough parts of most urban areas. Sure. But it was a community. Uh, we worked together, we, we, we fought together, we, we tried to make the life better. Every generation wants to make their children's lives better, and that's what we saw happening there. Uh, but I went, I had the privilege of attending a, a magnet high school. My sister and I have one younger sister, and we are fairly smart girls. Um, we were able to get into this institution. It changed my life. It was a uh, Whitney Young High School in Chicago, and it really helped me understand what it meant to be college ready. But that didn't mean I didn't flounder, so I graduated and went to Iowa State University an institution that was in the midst of diversifying its campus. So it went into all these large urban areas and they got all these brown and black kids and said, hey, come here to Iowa and, and try to figure out what it is to be a cyclone, which is what I, I stayed there and did. I did my bachelor's and my master's there in English. Uh, started off in pre-law because I thought I was going to become an attorney because the world needs just one more of those, I thought. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> uh, all the time, so I thought I'd do that. And But I kept reading these stories and I kept 
uh, wanting to understand the human condition. So I studied political science, I studied econ, I studied religious studies, and then I kept coming back to English and English, and I was a fairly good writer. So I stuck with that, and then I uh, continued and finished that and, and did my master's there and taught. And then I went into community colleges, and I spent over 25 years in community colleges, these great access points of America, probably the most distinctive American form of higher education we have in this country. Um, and I loved it and, and thought this is where I would be forever. But I got a call from a girlfriend one day and said, hey, have you heard of Nevada State College? And I said, no, well, what, what's, what's a Nevada State College? She said, look at it. So I read the job description and spent some time looking at the uh, website for the institution. I spent five hours looking at everything I could about Nevada State. And for the first time in 11 years, I called the search consultant and said, I think I'm the president. Because those students that we serve at Nevada State, uh, the ones I like to call the new majority, and, and oftentimes people are like, what do you mean by that? And I'll give you an example. When we think about the typical prototype of who's going to college, we have this image in our mind. And this image typically looks like uh, a young man who is going away to college, sometimes his parents' alma mater. Uh, he's gonna pledge and rush a sorority, a fraternity. He's gonna go to Cancun for spring break. He's gonna come home and he's going to get a job uh, that one of his parents were able to get him as a result of the golf course and he's gonna do quite well and get care packages every other week. That's the minority of who's actually going to college right now. Uh, the majority of people who are going to college are working adults. They're black and brown, they're first generation. Uh, they're trying to find their role within the American story. So for me, when I look at these students at Nevada State, 55% of my students are first generation. 75 to 80% would identify students of color. They're working two, three jobs. They're parenting. They have very complex lives. They're grappling with all the intersections that happen with that. I look at them, I thought, this is me. These are the stories. If I can go someplace and make a difference and try to amplify their stories and what we do, um, in a space where it doesn't really even know what a state college is and how it can be beneficial to that, I'm all in. So let me ask you this. Um, it's kind of an esoteric question, mm. I would guess. But, um, you know, most people have either access to cable, satellite, their phones to be able to see what's going on around the country. And to see that if they're in a bad situation in the town that they live in, you know, why is it that they are not able to make that move from that bad situation to a get to a place where they could end up with a place like Nevada State College mm -hmm. or any place of, of education or higher education to allow them to take the path that you took? Because it seems as though um, immigrants to this country see all this opportunity and go bonkers to get there. Mm -hmm. And yet we have people stuck in ghettos all across this country. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a couple of things have happened with that. One, knowing how to navigate a system. Let's forget that higher education wasn't designed for the students that you're talking about. It was primarily designed originally for white male landowners. That's who was originally decided it, higher it was designed for. And it has begun to evolve over time. The reality about this is we're still trying to figure out how to help people who look like me, whose experiences may be similar or different than mine, figure out how to navigate this. And here's the dirty secret about it. It's not just the ghettos of America people are trying to get out of. We're talking about Appalachia. We're talking about small towns. We're talking about communities in which higher education isn't been, hasn't been seen as a, a out for them. You know, I was, you know, when I arrived here, uh, Sam, I was struck by everybody who talked to me about the value of higher education. They kept saying, oh, you know, uh, you can graduate from high school and get a job on the strip making sixty, seventy thousand dollars in a few years you'd be making a hundred. And I said, where are those jobs at? They don't exist anymore. That's not a part of the, that's a part of a narrative, but the narrative doesn't exist anymore. So I think it's a combination of things. One is that we don't have enough models. Yeah, you, for every Darian that you see whose story uh, belied this architecture that we're talking about right here. The reality is I'm an anomaly. I'm a, I'm a unicorn. So how do we make more unicorns? I think we have to figure out how to feed them and nurture them, give them opportunities, talk about realities that help them access that. We have to figure out how to navigate the system. Uh, but then I think we also, to be quite frank in higher ed, have to figure out how to talk to those students, how to talk to those families, how to talk about education as a way of building uh, your economic mobility. We don't talk about that. Uh, one of the things I'm most struck by in our state as we move here is how do we start to talk about education, not as a, a fallback, 
but as a primary driver of the economy that we want to see. Uh, how do we get more C-suite jobs and companies coming to Nevada and making sure not that they're just putting the jobs here that end up on the, the welfare rolls of the state, but being very deliberate about how we build capacity. So I think it's a whole economic system, it's a structural system, um, and to be quite frank, at the end of the day, I think for some people, they don't think that's their story. Well, when you look at um, uh, the activities of corporations in terms of diversity, mm. are you comfortable um, that we're picking the brightest and the best uh, from communities of color um, to push them forward and then hopefully that they go back to their communities to raise up others? Or are we just filling the holes in the diversity chart? Mm, I don't know that. I, I wish I did. If I could figure that out, I probably could have a Nobel Prize and we'd be sitting here with this wonderful conversation. But I will say. <laughs> can uh, we share in no, that? No, I, I, I can I, choose I think, half a Nobel Prize. I think that's Prize. a really important question to be asked. You know, how are we building capacity in communities? Um, I, I'd also offer, you know, maybe a, a little bit of a different perspective as well is that we need to be talking in corporate America uh, deliberately about the lived experience of the folks once they come into those spaces. We have to be talking about the ways in which we craft environments where people can thrive and be successful there. I'm not quite sure that we, we have that equal part of those conversations. We're very quick to say, okay, folks, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get to where you need to be and work hard and hustle and grind and you're gonna do it. Except we forget sometimes they don't have bootstraps. <laughs> We forget sometimes they don't know how to navigate that. So I, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I wish we had more people asking it. All right, let's take a break. We'll sure. come back more uh, with Dr. Pollock. She's the president of Nevada State College after this timeout. Leaders find solutions. Politicians are part of the problem. Take Catherine Cortez Masto and Adam Laxalt. Cortez Masto co-sponsored a bill capping insulin costs. Adam Laxalt called a plan that caps costs reckless. No surprise, Laxalt is personally invested in big drug companies. When they make money, he makes money. That's the difference. Catherine Cortez Masto is lowering the cost of drugs. Adam Laxalt sells out and cashes in. SMP is responsible for the content of this ad. As you know, Reno is booming. Toll's development company is helping it grow with insightful design and development, building community with every project, adding beauty adding excitement, emphasizing our shared humanity. Reno is becoming bigger. Toll's development is helping it become better, more livable, more enjoyable. To learn more, go to tollsdevelopment.com, tollsdevelopment.com. Like a traditional handmade basket, retail is woven into the fabric of life in Nevada. From big box to mom and pop, retail supports our communities in countless ways. Jobs for the disabled, team uniforms for kids, help for the elderly, and so much more. Retail employs over 1 in 10 workers. Retail supports Nevada, and we support retail. R-A-N-N-V dot org. Hi, I'm Renee Summer, our digital news anchor here at 7 at 7. Watch our streaming nonstop newscast immediately with your mobile phone. 7 at 7 is the new way for you to get every bit of local news you need in just seven minutes. Breaking news, local neighborhood news, weather and sports are just a click away. Reporters bring you all of what's happening in the valley from Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, YouTube and more. Get every bit of local news you need from the RJ and LVRJ.com. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we continue our conversation with Darian uh, Pollard. She's the president of Nevada State College. Um, you talk about um, that COVID isn't the only thing you're dealing with. You're Ooh. dealing with COVID, racism, opioids, and mental health. And I got that from uh, the uh, interview you did with Las Vegas Weekly. Mm. Um, explain that briefly, if you could. So I, I think that there are we're having a reckoning that's happening in our country and oftentimes we say that uh, it is just COVID right now and, and even just saying just COVID really is, is, is not a fair statement. But I think we're dealing with the intersections of many epidemics that are happening right now and how they're manifesting themselves I think are things that uh, we should be spending more time talking about. So as I described, as you said, we have as an institution, you know, we certainly have to deal with COVID, how people are coming back as a result of that, how does that inform the, the policies that we generate, the culture we want to have. But prior to 
COVID even happening, we were grappling with an opioid epidemic that very few people were talking enough about. You know, uh, I left my institution in Maryland and we were in the process of uh, placing uh, medical uh, devices around campus that when someone ODs that we're prepared to respond to that. So you have that intersection. And then you add, uh, one does not get to forget what it's like to watch a man lose his life on television with someone on his neck and how we have not continued to grapple with that as a, as a country. Oh, and by the way, we've had to grapple with all three of those things while also dealing with mental health challenges that are rampant in our community and only became more manifest during a, a, a COVID epidemic where we were oftentimes stuck in homes. We didn't have the adequate resources. So now we're all back in the public square, Sam. We're coming back in and all the things that we were we were afraid to grapple with or didn't know how to grapple with, they all come to bear again. And on college campuses, these are profound moments because now we're trying to help not only our students understand and grapple with this and name it and own it, navigate it, but also think about what that means for the communities that we serve. Uh, how do we have the appropriate resources for that? How do we grapple with things that now have become political conversations? I mean, the idea of, of COVID as being seen primarily as a political um, thing that divide us, that, that's a problem to me, let alone talking about racism, let alone talking about mental health, let alone talking about the intersections of these issues. And, and these are all things that you believe should be discussed um, on, the, on the college campus, but is it the college campus's responsibility uh, to deal with them? Not, not to, to discuss, but well, to deal with them. I don't know how we can't. If a student ODs on your campus, how do you not deal with that? If you have in the classroom the manifestation of a faculty member of the staff or staff having a mental uh, collapse and being fresh, how do you not? So you don't, you, we may not have the expertise, so we bring in other people to help us, but we don't get to tap out because it makes us uncomfortable. All right, more with the president of Nevada State College after this time out. Reckless government spending on frivolous projects is bad enough. Even worse, spending to send COVID relief checks to criminals in prison. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto voted to allow COVID relief checks to go to the likes of the Boston Marathon bomber and hundreds of thousands of other convicted murderers and criminals, allowing almost a billion dollars in COVID relief checks to go to hardened criminals in prison. Tell Senator Cortez Masto to start voting against reckless, wasteful spending to stop inflation. The Nevada Builders Alliance has been protecting the interests of the construction industry for over 50 years. Our programs save members thousands of dollars every year and allow them to provide much needed benefits to their employees. Our industry also allows Nevada to grow. If you're thinking about a career in the construction industry, reach out. And if you haven't thought of a career in construction, what are you waiting for? We are the Nevada Builders Alliance. Each day, the Children's Advocacy Alliance partners with leaders, legislators, and families across Nevada to improve children's health, education, economic well-being, and safety. We recognize Nevada will be no better than the state of its children. Be a part of this change. Be a supporter of the Children's Advocacy Alliance. For more information, go to caanv.org. Southwest Specialties has been making the homes and businesses of Nevada beautiful for more than 20 years. Their experienced designers and craftsmen create the walkways, backyards, water features, and a variety of outdoor cooking areas that add curb appeal and value to your investment. Call today or visit them at their website and see how they can make your outdoor spaces special. Southwest Specialties, creative, distinctive, beautiful. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we continue our conversation with Darian uh, Pollard. She is the president of Nevada State College. You have a master's in English. I do. And I have a goofy question for you, oh but boy. it bothers me a lot, which is now that we receive our programming, not through FCC approved channels, but through streaming um, and all these other uh, access points, it seems to me that language has become so much more coarse to the point where swear words are losing their meaning. Mm -hmm. um, I was taught in English class back a thousand years ago 
um, that if you really wanted to insult somebody, use a proper word and make them look it up in the dictionary to see how well they were insulted. Where are we with language? Mm. I think language really has become, and, and you would say that it should be evolving. You know, if you think about the fact that Latin became a dead language because it refused to evolve, it refused to take on additional new words. Uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, we have to be able to talk about civility, is what I actually hear you saying. Language is a reflection of culture, it's a reflection of our lack of civility. And that to me is what's really the issue here. Um, my father used to drive him crazy. When, you know, I, he said, baby, conjugate that verb correctly because I'd have a whole different thing. And, but the keys don't know how to code switch, right? So I know that there's certain places where uh, I know when I'm at my home, there's a certain language that I may use. I'm with my girlfriends, there's a certain language I may use. When I'm in academia, uh, they like a polysyllabic word, so let's go ahead and use that as well. But when I'm also talking with communities about the value of education, depending on that community, there's a way that we use language as a way of an inroad. So language is manifesting, it is evolving thoughtfully. I think the question for us is to figure out what do we really want to be saying. And this issue of civility, I think that's at the root of the issue. We've lost that. Um, whether it be from the highest offices of this country all the way down to the way in which we choose to interact with each other at an airport. All of these things are reflections of that. I couldn't agree with you more. I look forward to visiting with you again. I love that. Um, and hopefully you'll be coming to Carson City during the legislative session. We have a studio located down there. We look forward to seeing you then. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the president of Nevada State College. We'll be back after this timeout. It's the $85,000 football frenzy at Tamarack Casino with up to $15,000 in weekly cash and free play giveaways and $25,000 in grand prize giveaways Thursday, September 29th. Your good times are at Tamarack Casino during the $85,000 football frenzy. I'm here at the Carson Valley Inn in Mendham with Joey Whitaker. One of the things I love about the Carson Valley Inn here in beautiful downtown Mendham is CB steak. I have eaten here so many times. Tell folks what they can expect when they come here to eat. It's a beautiful room, great service. We have certified Angus beef, seafood, lamb, a great range of appetizers, and wonderful desserts. Jean-Michel's done a great job of selecting some beautiful wines for us. The customers love it, and we've got a great selection of cocktails as well. It's not a long way to get away to the Carson Valley Inn. A bird's eye captures its surroundings at different heights. At Brian Culp of Photography, we can make your imagination soar over buildings, parks, cityscapes, and beyond. Brian's images tell the story and get the job done. If you need a new perspective to tell your story, contact Brian today. Brian Culpa Photography. Experience the bird's eye view at brianculpaphotography.com. Safety is the number one priority for the trucking industry. Over $7 billion a year is spent on technology like this electronic eye that will apply the brakes automatically. But the most important factor for safety is the truck driver. These hardworking men and women who safely move over 70% of our nation's freight and 94% of Nevada's. We thank you because trucks move America forward. Nevada Newsmakers Studio is located at the headquarters of the Nevada Trucking Association. Motion and purpose are a truck's greatest virtue. As always, you can watch Nevada Newsmakers 24 hours a day at nevadanewsmakers.com. You can also check our archive going back to 2005 on our website, again, nevadanewsmakers.com. We'll see you on the next show.